Hey, this is John of the Gillum. Make sure you go check out all my books. Start with the best-selling Sheep No More, The Art of Awareness and Attack Survival, and the two workbooks that are fillable that go right along with it, the Threat Assessment and Defense Assessment Workbooks. Also, for your children, The Adventures of Team Little Bigs, A Parent's Book for Children. Now, that's a book of pictures you give to your children, and you let them go through it, and in the pictures are lessons about security and awareness, and you, the parent, go over to teamlittlebigs.com and download the free lesson plans that go with each picture. All of this is a package that makes your life, your family more aware, safer, and able to look at yourself from the attacker's point of view. Sheep No More, The Art of Awareness and Attack Survival. It's two accompanying workbooks and the adventures of Team Little Bigs, a parent's book for children, and the lesson plans that exist on teamlittlebigs.com. And now, let's start the show. By the way, anti-fascists are the ones who fight the Nazis. Shut up, you idiot! This is Jonathan Gillum back in on the Experts Podcast. The truth has arrived. Sing it, Melissa. Don't forget, that's Melissa Burnos, also known as Burnos. And you get that song. There's a whole ton of other songs that, uh, that she sings and you get them on itunes and um absolutely amazing singer and uh rock star and uh, make sure you go check her out on itunes give her your support Uh, she is um a force to be reckoned with with a voice like that so we had yesterday an incredible conversation with dr cody mcginnis uh, Cody is a military intelligence veteran and a doctor of clinical psychology. And it was, it was really an eye-opening experience for a lot of people. And uh, what, was, what was so eye-opening about it is that people, I don't think that a lot of people realize how vulnerable they are. I don't think a lot of people realize that, that they themselves have been, in, have been indoctrinated by the left. I mean, they, they may have been raised in a very moral and ethical home, uh, but they don't understand a lot of times what they're actually angry about. And a lot of people don't understand also that, and we can ask Cody about this, but, uh, or Dr. McGinnis, we can ask him about this, but I, I think, I think that, um, narcissism is something, if it's not clinical, I think it could be programmed into people the way that social media and the way that uh, all the things in and just media in general and in school and the way things are now so judgmental that uh, people can actually um, grow to not love themselves and then since become more uh, narcissistic. I don't know. We're going to ask him about that. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about um, what actually these groups are and how you could be indoctrinated. We talked about the the fact that there is the ability to indoctrinate people um, and to uh, radicalize, I guess you could, I use the word indoctrination, but uh, you call it radicalize, indoctrinate, recruit, however you want to, whatever word you want to use. But uh, I think that um, it's something that we should expand on, but I also want to get into more of what is actually going on, who's responsible for it, and what, might possibly happen in the future now before i get to that before i get to cody i want to just real quick talk a little bit about atlanta and about what's happening in atlanta because what is going on there is so crazy right now with i watched even on fox news today i watched um the 
the coverage that they're giving of the shooting that happened in Atlanta and the officer that is now in jail. He, he turned himself in. And the whole process of how that's unfolding is the most corrupt thing I've ever seen in my life. We have now in this country got to a point where as a police officer, and I hope cops are listening to this. If you listen to this show and you're a law enforcement officer, you should be sharing this and insisting that other uh, officers listen to this because, and not just this show, there's been other shows where I've been critical of law enforcement, critical because of this very reason, understanding the uh, politics of what's going on, how it affects you, and also owning up to your role in this because there there is, I don't care what anybody in law enforcement says. I was in law enforcement. I saw it firsthand. There is a disconnect between law enforcement and the, the society in which they police. And it's, I'm not blaming the cops. I'm not blaming the inner city. I'm saying they're both to blame. And the inner city in and of itself is really where the beginning of the cyclical program starts. It's not like it was when there were kings and queens. It's not like there is an oppressive government that is throttling down the freedoms of people. That's not where it starts. Where it starts is with children being born out of wedlock, fatherless homes, drug use, violence, and young men and women being raised in a society where they are told you have no hope, you have there's no chance of you ever it's helpless you might as well forget you're never going to get out of here and it's all because of your color because of the color of your skin absolutely none of that is true but that's what they're taught and so they grow up with a disrespectful mind and then when you throw in the mix of that individuals men and women that have to police those areas and we are a nation of laws if we didn't have laws in law enforcement you were you would have chaos which you're seeing right now and which you will have if you elect a democrat president and if you elect democrat mayors and democrat governors you are going to have chaos eventually that's where they go that's what they're looking for and right now what's happening in atlanta is a perfect example of where this relationship, this terrible relationship between law enforcement and the inner city, and this vicious cycle of, of this location where it's so violent that law enforcement has to continuously put on an aggressive stance, that it has affected, that stance has affected everybody else they deal with. They could deal with one nasty criminal violent person in a week and that is enough to push you to a point you, where you say, all my tactics say that I need to be ready for this. And so I have to face every situation from this level looking down rather than eye to eye with the person. And, but, I, but I'll tell you, out of all this, all I said and all I criticized, I think the officers in the George Floyd, excuse me, not George Floyd incident, but in the uh, incident in Atlanta, I think the way they responded was 100% correct. They were cool. They were calm. They didn't go there and make the situation worse. They, de they de-escalated. I mean, he was actually very calm as well. The whole situation, if you watch for 40 minutes, was totally calm and exactly the way you would want law enforcement to be. I haven't heard anybody talk about that. No one in media has talked about how incredible these cops were when they showed up. And it didn't escalate until that guy got into the fight, started the fight, and got in the fight and grabbed the taser and shot it at the police. And he got killed, which is justifiable because the Supreme Court says you don't have to wait. It's not, it's not like Top Gun. It's not like you cannot fire until fired upon. If they show that they are an imminent threat of loss of, uh, uh, or if there is an imminent threat of loss of life or serious bodily injury, law enforcement officers can use lethal force to eliminate the threat. And so people say, well, you know, it was just a taser. Tasers or police officers carry taser and they're, they're certified as least, least, uh, less than lethal. But the thing is, law enforcement has to go through a course and get certified to know how to use it in a less than lethal capacity. If you shoot somebody in the face, or sometimes if you hit them around the chest, 
you or even there's just certain ways that you can hit them where you can kill a person it has actually happened so it can be lethal so what you what you have to realize is the nonsense that's going on on television is spin they are taking this just like they took the george floyd incident and they are making it into something that it's not and that not is what Dr. McGinnis and I have been talking about now and we'll be talking yesterday and we'll be talking about today is the fact that they are trying to, they, that's who we're going to talk about. Who are they and what exactly are they trying to do by spinning this in the way that they have? So with that being said, I'm going to use another, now from now on, when I introduce uh, my expert guests, I'm going to use another uh, Burno song. This one's called Warship. Let's uh let's have a little introduction music here. You know, since I'm introducing a veteran, Warship, that's this is Warship by Burnos. I can't think of a, a better song than to bring on a military intelligence veteran and doctor of clinical psychology, Dr. Cody McGinnis, doctor. Hey Jonathan, thanks thanks for having me on, man. <laughs> that's your uh here, I'll play one more second of it. Now, you were in the Air Force, correct? I was, yeah. Don't hold that against me. No, we love to do air. Listen, when I was in Bud's, <laughs> Air Force push-ups were our favorite because that, that that's where you that's where you lay on your back and push up in the air. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we love those. Um, so you're you're an expert, as we were talking about yesterday, on disinformation and radicalization. I've been calling it all kinds of stuff. Indoctrination. You may call, I don't know if you fit. Listen, I make up my own terms a lot. Okay, so <laughs> disinformation and radicalization. I call it uh, indoctrination. Um, and the the president of Geopsych Consultants LLC, and you can find him at geopsychconsultants.com. I don't know if I mentioned that yesterday, but um, so. You know, yesterday when we were talking, a lot of people, uh, the feedback we got was amazing because people just didn't, they didn't realize, as I was saying at the beginning of the show, they don't realize about this indoctrination. They don't actually, mm -hmm. or, or as you call radicalization, but it, let's just call it following and being, um, being uh, convinced to follow and, and, mm -hmm. and not just follow, but to partake in whatever radical behavior that they are trying to get you to partake in. And sure. we talked a lot about the, the narcissism and uh, the reality of, you know, clinical narcissism versus whatever. What would you call the narcissism that you see today? You may have said that yesterday, but what we are, what we are seeing in people uh, that that will follow the way that they do. What is that actually called? Well, it, you know, you, you said something at um, the, the start of the show uh, about. I, th I think you mentioned that we all have these personality features and, you know, I think that that's, that's something that we need to recognize is that all of the characteristics that make each and every one of us unique as individuals can also leave us vulnerable to being exploited by, by adversaries. Mm -hmm. So w with the conversation that we started yesterday about narcissism and the role that that can play in the, uh, the radicalization process, I mean, we are talking about, uh, narcissistic personality features. You know, we're not talking about a, a the, the clinical diagnosis of narcissism because there are there's there's a lot of other aspects to to the diagnosis. But we are talking about narcissistic personality features. And again, we all have unique personality features. But you know, the thing is, personality traits. I mean, on their own, in and of themselves, they're not inherently pathological. You know, meaning they don't, you know, possessing certain personality traits, which again, we all possess to varying degrees, it, it, that does not equate to a, a clinical diagnosis. But the thing to keep in mind when it comes to personality, the personality does play a role in how we interpret the world around us. It's like, it's like a lens that goes over our eyes and we all have a unique lens. And so we are all interpreting the world around us through that lens. And so that that relates to what news articles we pay attention to, what content, if you're somebody who actually reads the content in the news articles, what content is most uh, uh, kind of sticks out the most to you. Um, and, in, you know, in different types of circumstances, you know, our personalities can play a role in, 
what types of circumstances are more likely to elicit strong emotional reactions from us compared to, to other types of circumstances. But we are talking about personality features that are involved in that radicalization process. You know, one thing you said yesterday when I was listening back to this show that really stood out was that, um, what the Russians do in disinformation, and it's not just the Russian, but this is definitely something that they do, and it's what I see happening now. It's what happened all through uh, the uh, Trump-Russia uh, collusion nonsense is that they create a narrative first, and then the content and the substance is created and shaped around the narrative. Um, you know, we, another way of saying that is entrapment. You know, we could go to somebody sure. who's not guilty and convince them to do something and then arrest them for it. That's entrapment. And in the case of and we and, and we uh, bad law enforcement or whoever that would entrap somebody, they literally create uh, they say, OK, this person is bad, even though they're not bad. They say that person's bad. And then they create all the evidence that just falls right into place. And then they and then they charge them with that. So when we see everything that's been happening with Trump since he's been in office, when the left says, okay, we need blood splatter on the wall, all of a sudden blood splatter exists. And that seems to be, and then they make the narrative around it. Well, that blood splatter got there because the, you know, the president did this or he did that and he caused this. They're doing it right now um, with, with John Bolton's book. You know, they're using that. The mm -hmm. exact, that book is a narrative and then they're going to build all the stuff around it, whether it happened or not. And you're, you're seeing with what is happening in uh, all these cities that started with George Floyd's death and has sprung into something that has nothing to do with George Floyd's death. So I thought that was very interesting when you brought up that point. And out of all the things we talked about yesterday, that I think is the most visible thing, you know. Mm -hmm. People have to self-analyze, and that's how they discover, you know, do I fit in this category of slight narcissist or somebody who's a follower or so on and so forth. But this is actually something that you can see outside of yourself, something that exists in the public's eye, and you can see it happening. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, yesterday we were, uh, we were talking a lot about, we'll, we'll continue this conversation, we were talking a lot about Marxist organizations that, you know, that, that take advantage of and exploit this unrest in America, you know, ultimately hijacking the narrative, you know, which is, which is why we are, why we're no longer discussing the senseless death of George Floyd and, and why, you know, we're not having a conversation about racial disparities. Instead, you know, we're, we're looking at these, these, uh, these cosplay revolutionaries in the, in the Seattle autonomous zone. We're reading about news stories about the, you know, the white kid bragging on social media about creating multiple cocktails and then burning down the Minneapolis police precinct, mm -hmm. you know, so there is, there is a, there's very much a, a radicalization process uh, at play here that is leading to individuals identifying with an ideology like Marxism, which, you know, by the way, just to, to, to mention this again, because I think it should be mentioned, Marxism happened to kill about 100 million people in the 20th century. Right. So, so it, it should be alarming to everyone that Marxism has such a foothold in current events in America today. So one of the things I want to ask you about, and there's two things here. One, um, I know that we talked about the radicalization again. You don't mistake the doctor's words for my words. I talk about indoctrination, um, recruitment, and radicalization. Uh, uh, well, first off, would you put those all in the same category like I do? Well, the, the, the disinformation is really an aspect of the radicalization process. Right. So it's, it's the disinformation that contributes to the radicalization. And I think, you know, your, I think how you're describing indoctrination, I, I think it's fair to say that that's, you know, that's, that's accurate. That's what the radicalization process is. It is, it is indoctrination. So, so yeah, I, I, I would agree with you on that. I just, I think it's important to note that disinformation happens along the way to radicalization, right? It's the disinformation is an, is, is one of those components that ultimately that ultimately turns people into useful idiots. And, and so the thing, this is what I want to ask you, and maybe they come uh, in different arrangements in different circumstances, but radicalization, does it always follow disinformation or is disinformation a part of 
the radicalization process? No, I, I, you can certainly have radicalization without without disinformation. Um, you know, you can, and again, you know, that's that's you, you got to consider those personality features as well. So, certainly, someone with a, a particular level of of narcissism could be vulnerable to even to accurate information that they find online. It just so happens that because their personality is how they interpret the world around them, you know, that, that is what could contribute to the radicalization process, even without the disinformation occurring. And that's, you don't have to have disinformation in place. If that particular lens with which that person sees the world around them through, if that particular lens is so, so skewed, so, so biased, uh, you know, you may not even need the disinformation and, and, and they can certainly become radicalized without it. Um, when we're looking at this, the radicalization process and how it relates to disinformation, how does all this add up in the big picture of things, right? So we're seeing, and we know that young people, for instance, have been indoctrinated now for years and years. Some of these, the people now that are 19 years old, grew up um by and large hearing about you know uh, our war with radical islam in the background mm -hmm. they grew mm -hmm. up with mtv uh viacom uh, teen vogue nickelodeon disney all of these which are connected to far left agendas uh the people that run these uh these networks it gets you know you can i knew when cmt country music channel i knew when it went left we were done and NASCAR mm -hmm. now, NASCAR's done. I'm just at my wits end. I won't even watch NASCAR anymore. It's too bad because I, I was a, a real fan of NASCAR, but it's done because they went so far left. Yeah. Um, when we look at, we know that people have been radicalized and it's been a long process, I think, not something that just uh, happened, you know, because they're religious zealots and it happened over, you know, a, period, a year period of time or something like that. This happened over... Um, a lifetime for sure. some of these young people. And, uh, and now there's this big picture of this movement. And as the movement gets bigger in this country, the, the actual thing, that thing that makes this country so great, that freedom is being diminished. I mean, you cannot say what you feel anymore. You cannot, you can't even, you're not even supposed to feel it. They will literally, you can be fired from your job now for feeling something wrong that they don't agree with. And so how does this add up to the big picture of what we're looking at? Sure. Well, you know, just, just, just in terms of, uh, of recent events, uh, you know, right now you've got, you've got really two primary foreign adversaries, Russia and China that are uh, both seeking to exploit the, the present circumstances in the U.S. And I think uh, Drudge has a, a link to an article right now about the Chinese Communist Party's use of propaganda on social media, and particularly uh, propaganda and disinformation related to, to COVID-19. You know, it, but, but for Russia, I think there is and, 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 and will continue to be a strong effort to keep up, to keep the momentum up and, and ultimately exploit the current state of our economy, you know, which due to COVID-19 to exploit the protests, uh, and to exploit division over the upcoming election. You know, I mean, and, and honestly, man, I mean, if, if we think things are bad now, you know, if, if Trump wins, just wait until what happens the day after election, wait until November 4th, because I, it's going to be absolute chaos. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just in terms of, of the, of the larger picture and, and sort of, you know, how does this unfold and, 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 you know, how does, how, how do all these pieces fit together? You know, I, I think particularly when it comes to disinformation, there's, there's a couple of major things occurring. Um, you know, yesterday we, we talked about, uh, you know, the, the end goal for an adversary like Russia is ultimately to create a civil war situation in the U S but that's, you know, that's at the, that's at the extreme end, you know, that's, that's, that's the ideal situation, but then there's a lot that happens in order to get to that point along the way. And so, you know, before you get to that point, there's this other process unfolding involving, uh, in my opinion, involving 
something called the Overton window. Now, the Overton window is this is basically the the range of political opinions and ideas that is acceptable in the present day, with basically the left on one end of the window and the right the right on the other. Now, the reason I bring up the Overton window, particularly in relation to Marxism, is you know, Marxism, in my opinion, I think it, it really started to get a foothold in America following uh, uh, the, the Bolshevik Revolution against the Rus- Russian Empire, which was, which was in, uh, in, in 1917. So, so if you've got, if you think, you know, in 1917, Marxism started to emerge in America. So if you've got the seeds of Marxism planted 100 years ago in the U.S., I mean, that's, that's a long time for Marxism to to weasel its way into our democracy. Right. So the, the impact of that over time is that really you, you start to see this Overton window expand, right? To where beliefs that were perhaps once unheard of in the U S suddenly start to become more and more acceptable. And, and the result of that is that you end up with more people on, on both ends on, 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 on both ends extreme ends of the Overton window. And, and the more that that Overton window expands, I think what happens in the U S is, is the more people sort of feel forced into this, this dichotomy of either you support this thing or you must be for whatever the polar opposite of that thing is. Mm-hmm. So the, the, so, so I, in, in, in my opinion, I think the Marxism it, particularly within the education system, has expanded the Overton window in terms of what beliefs are considered acceptable, and that the, the extremism on both ends of the spectrum creates uh, fuels this dichotomy, and and ultimately, you know, what you end up happening is just what, what you end up see happening is just sort of it, it, it's always everything boils down to kind of one side versus the other side. What is that and called? What was that called again? What's the, the phrase called? That, that's the Overton window. Okay. Now, when we make decisions, and, and this definitely applies to, to voting, but uh, beyond voting, just even in our daily lives, the decision-making process that we all go through, it, we, use, we use heuristics. We're not typically aware that we're using heuristics, but heuristics are it's a, it's a process that basically – it's, it's something that we employ in an effort to simplify decision making. So basically, uh, uh, different you know different uh, uh, key pieces of information that kind of stand out to us about uh, you know some particular situation. We may hold on to that key piece of information, discard everything else, and make a decision based off you know this one thing. So heuristics are used to simplify decision making. But when you've got the Overton window expanding mm-hmm. and uh, uh, Americans feeling like they have to be forced into this dichotomy between either you're for this thing or you're for its polar opposite, then that causes people to employ more heuristics in their decision-making processes to where they think decisions, and, and this goes along with what we talked about yesterday with the, the decrease in critical thinking, but people aren't really analyzing their decisions like they used to because critical thinking is going down. They're just basing decisions off that dichotomy and using those heuristics to make those decisions. And you see this, you see this with journalism as well. You know, with you know, with with identity politics showing up in journalism. I mean, I think identity politics has really made journalists lazy, <laughs> largely because it seems that mainstream media has forgotten the meaning of nuance. Right? It's it, it, it's that dichotomy of they don't even identity. try anymore. They don't even right. try. They they don't try to hide when they lie or, or, or anything. I mean, like you'll sit there and watch a report about protest and the, um, the coronavirus and they won't mention the Corona or the, it's about the protest, right? They won't mention yeah. the coronavirus or they'll just say like, you know, we'll see what happens. You know, well, the, it, you know, these people were out there, they, they felt charged to be out there. And then in the very next breath, They'll talk about the dangers. They're going to have a whole episode on the dangers of the president's rally in Oklahoma. Right. And they don't even try to hide it. Let me, let me ask you this real quick. I know you were going somewhere, but let me ask you about this, um, 
uh, what was it called? The, uh, the Overton window. Now I'm, uh -huh. I'm looking at a diagram on it and it goes up and down. Shouldn't it be going left and right? You know, I mean, well, cause I that, mean that's the reality yeah. of our political system is left and right, not up and down. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's, it's, it's all about how can you, you know, when, when, when you think about, uh, when uh, take the, the, the Marxist organization, for instance, who are taking advantage of the circumstances in the U S right now, you know, with the Overton window, how is that applicable in this case? Well, there is, there's an effort to introduce ideas that are so extreme. And in some cases, uh, well, you see this with politicians all the time. Also, in some cases, the idea that the person introduces is so extreme. They, they know that it's so extreme, but they're hoping that what they're, they're hoping that you will settle for something that gives them that that moves uh, things forward in the direction that they want them to go in. So they know ultimately you're not going to settle on the extreme position that they are putting forth. But they know that by putting forth such an extreme position, they're hoping that they can at least get you to move closer towards 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 their position. Which is the the same thing we we're talking about yesterday when it comes to uh, the on the football field, um, where you're yeah. you're yeah. moving the goalpost and you're getting slower, slower, slower to the left in this case. And and, and so I just want to explain to everybody real quick what I'm looking at here. You have this is up and down uh, rather, and I looked actually look at another one. It was left and right, so I guess it can go either way. <laughs> but it says unthinkable, radical. And this is going uh, down, so we're we're starting at the very top. Unthinkable, radical, acceptable, sensible, popular policy, and, and that's in the middle. And then popular. This is still under it. Popular, sensible, acceptable, radical, unthinkable. So either way you go to the extremes of one or the other is going to be uh, unthinkable and radical. But isn't it now to the point where we are like, instead of coming back over the, the center line of policy that we are now far to the left. So what is, uh, except what is radical now seems to be, that's where the goalpost is right now, like between radical and acceptable, because it really has nothing to do with, is it effective? It just has to do with, is it acceptable? And right now, if there's any pushback on what's happening in the country, which they're formulating this, right? They're, they're going to convict this guy of murder, or they're going to charge him with murder or did charge him with murder in, in Atlanta for this cop who did everything right. Now he's charged with murder. And uh, they had all these riots. Now they're calling, I guess this is a better way to put it. At first it was protest, peaceful protest. Then they started rioting. Now they're calling tearing down statues protest, when in reality it's a riot. So now even people who don't agree with it are calling that a protest. So they've moved all the way over yeah. where they're just on the edge of radical. Yeah. And acceptance. And you see it happen all the time in, 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 in politics as well. But, you know, in this case, it's uh, the Overton window is I think, kind of being weaponized, uh, particularly by uh, Marxist organizations. Yeah. So go ahead with what you're saying. I'm, I mean, I'm just trying to give people a, a, a good understanding of what this Overton window is. And it and I've heard it before. I know I, Glenn Beck used to talk about it a lot, you know, back on his show when he was on Fox. I don't know if he called it the Overton window, but it was uh, it was pretty much the same thing of what you're talking about here. Well, so, I mean, this is the idea of of, of the long game, you know, and I, I I'm I know I was using that phrase a lot yesterday. Hopefully you're not uh, sick of hearing me say it yet, but that's, that's how, how disinformation, particularly Russian uh, disinformation works. You know, it, it's all about the seeds that get planted that can grow and then ultimately affect, have, have a big enough impact on policy to where you slowly over time and, and because of the, the, the strategy involved in this process, you know, we're often not even aware that it's happening, but over time, extreme positions on, on both ends start to become more and more acceptable. And, and that's the weaponization of the Overton window. And but particularly with, with Marxism, you plant these seeds a hundred years ago, you let Marxism take a, a hold in 
the American education system, for instance, uh, you know, you watch critical thinking go down, you watch the endorsement of, of uh, fundamental Marxism go up on college campuses. And over time, you, you, you pushed this Overton window, you, you made that range of what's acceptable uh, grow larger and larger and larger. And what's happening is that the policies, uh, you know, with, with Marxism, the policies that are being implemented because that range of what's acceptable is growing larger and larger and larger, well, it pushes, you know, it, it further at further fuels the rise of Marxism in, in, in America. And, and, and we know how Marxism ends, right? We know how communism ends. Yeah. It, 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 it doesn't end well. It's not pretty. And, and it's not pretty. And, it's and not, go ahead. You know, it, yeah, it, it, it's not pretty. I mean, you know, the other day I was, uh, I was reading quotes from, the leader of of, uh, of Chechnya, yeah, that's Rams and Cat- that, That's what I was going to ask you about. First of all, because yeah. I, you know, I, I went through your notes, and first of all, I thought Russia and Chechnya did not get along. When did that change? Uh, that that changed when uh, Rams and Katerov's father died, and Rams and Katerov took over. Mm-hmm. Uh, when 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 that process occurred, uh, Rams and Katerov sort of, in you know, I'll, I can talk more about narcissism and, and the idea of an idealizable figure uh, and, I'll, and, and I'll talk more about that but but in this case when Rams and Katerov took over uh, you know Putin became a figure for him that he that he basically worshipped and, and, and Rams and Katerov uh, worshipped his father you know and that's and, and you see this in narcissism you see this in malignant narcissism but just just in general narcissism is you know a narcissist will only uh, uh, seek to to relate to someone that they view as uh, being equally as great or greater than themselves. That, those are the types of people that they want to attach to. So, for individuals who are who are really narcissistic, you know, they will try to attach themselves to someone who has a level of, of what they view as sort of brilliance and 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 just you know I, I, who who has the who, who's a, just a great figure. And the narcissist will say, you know, by attaching myself to this person, number one, uh, I could potentially become this person. So they're seeking to sort of merge with that person. Um, you know, and, and, and number two, it's, it's also this idea of, well, I think of myself as being brilliant and I have this very grandiose sense of self. Uh, and so, of course, I, I can only attach to someone who I view as also being equally as great. And so. In the case of, of Rams and Katerov, after his father died and he took over, Putin stepped in to fill the shoes of his father, and Putin became this figure who, whom Katerov uh, worshipped. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and and I bring Katerov up because he, I was I was reading quotes the other day from him in response to the to the unrest occurring in in America, and and again Katerov, controlled by Putin, worships Putin, is and always has been in Putin's back pocket. Now. Katerov's interesting because, you know, if you guys want to know what a real dictator, what a real dictator with malignant narcissism looks like, look into what's been happening since Katerov took over. Look into the gay purges that have occurred in Chechnya in which Katerov, Katerov has stated that there are no gay men in his country while he meanwhile kidnaps, tortures, and kills gay men in Chechnya so that his narrative, as you were saying earlier, it's the narrative becomes reality, right? This is why I said Russian disinformation begins with the narrative and then reality is shaped around that narrative. So, so listen to this. This is what Katerov said. So Katerov, he, he urged the UN to, quote, intervene and take effective measures against official U.S. authorities to prevent the practice of violating human rights and freedoms and extrajudicial executions. He went on to say, call them to account for their atrocities and, in particular for the persecution and murder of innocent people. He adds, I demand that U.S. authorities stop this lawlessness, stop the illegal actions against the civilian population immediately, and bring to account all those responsible for human rights violations. So this is a prime example of, of that disinformation long game that Russia plays, right? Fuel civil unrest, control the narrative, and then criticize the response to the unrest. Say that now. Say that one more time. They fuel civil unrest. They seek to control the narrative and hijack the narrative, and then they criticize the response 
to the unread. So that is very right. that's very close to the Hegelian dialect. Very mm -hmm. close to it. I mean, where you you cause the problem, you offer the solution, and then you manufacture the result. Or, mm -hmm. or, or yeah, so the the overall result. So you're in charge of everything basically in that in that uh, in that instance. And that sounds exact. Is it basically the same thing? Yeah, at, at, absolutely. And you see you see this in in present day Russia too, where it's it's not uncommon for for Russian intelligence to to start a protest movement so that they can control it. They, they're in control every, every every step of the way. Now that's what a lot of people. I, I can't you know go down this road of uh, this far conspiracy, but a lot of people have been saying that they that they believe what happened to George Floyd was planned. A lot of people are saying now about the thing that happened in Atlanta that the guy never showed any signs of being drunk. That um, uh, that the fight with the police that they wanted that so that they could. And it was done there so that they could get the cops there and they could get in a fight. I don't, according to what, you know, everybody thinks that they didn't mean to, for him to die, but they meant for the fight to happen so they could publicize it. Now, I don't know. I don't know what the guy blew on the, uh, the breathalyzer, but, uh, I can't go down that, that road, but I think it is fair to say that people, that, that some of the things that occur, like through the entire Russian scandal uh, with Trump and uh, everything else that they've tried to, to oh, the, the call to the Ukrainian dictator, all those things, when I look at that, I look at a, a setup where you, you uh, basically lay out the problem, you create the problem, and then they offer the solution, which would be impeach the president, and then they completely handle the entire process of trying to get him impeached. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I, I think, you know, and I'll go back and just, just to comment, you know, I, I, I can say certainly on, on my end, my personal opinion, I, I definitely do not buy into this idea that, uh, you know, that, that the death of, of George Floyd was, was something that was, was sort of planned. I think it was, it was absolutely a, a, a senseless death, you know, and I'm not, and I agree, I'm not, uh, and I'm not, I'm not Chris Cuomo. I'm not going to not, I can't analyze uh, law enforcement tactics. I don't, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm an, I'm an Intel guy. Right. But, but what I do know is that after George Floyd's death, there were Marxist organizations that viewed that as an opportunity to jump in and take advantage of the situation. Mm -hmm. there, 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 there's no doubt. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and, and then, you know, to, to the other point that you bring up, yeah, you know, I, I, I develop, uh, I, I look at, I look at geopolitical situations unfolding around the world. And I take a look at leadership in, in particular countries. And I take a look at what are the personality traits that a particular leader might have. Right. And that's important. That's important for a company that's doing business overseas to be aware of in the event that they're thinking about establishing operations in a country that maybe has a history of, of declaring martial law or a history of, of, uh, you know, murdering journalists or, or, uh, you know, a, a, a violent oppression. You know, if, if you're a company operating over there, you know, in whatever country it may be, it's important that you have a sense of what are the, what are the traits that those in power possess. But the thing is that can certainly be reverse engineered, right? If, if you're aware of how a person may respond to situation A, or you're aware of how a person may respond to situation B, then, you know, who's to say that you can't create that situation so that you can try to get the reaction uh, that you're hoping to get. And, and so that's, I, I, I absolutely believe that that's a process that can be, uh, that can be reverse engineered. And I know, um, you know, for me, I just, just to see the, the, the number of, 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 uh, psychiatrists, psychologists and individuals, uh, you know, affiliated or who were once affiliated, or I think in some cases, uh, still affiliated with the intelligence community to see them, you know, after Trump got elected to see them, uh, just put out these quickly put out these, these personality assessments referring to him as, you know, in, insinuating or, or, or outright diagnosing him as being this sort of malignant narcissist, which, 
you know, I just talked to you about Ramsey Catarro. Mm -hmm. That's a malignant narcissist. Okay. But, but there is this, there was definitely this, this, uh, this experience that I had where I saw people who, who do the sort of, uh, profiling work that I have my expertise in. And I, I, I saw them put out these statements about, about Trump. And, you know, it, it's just really interesting that there's this idea, you know, that he's, he's this malignant narcissist. And then now here it is, uh, you know, a, a, a few months before the November elections and, you've got the circumstances that uh, ultimately, you know, are, are, are sort of perfect for a malignant narcissist to respond to very harshly. Right. Right. I mean, if, if, if you know, if, if you're talking about a malignant narcissist uh, who's faced with maybe a situation like the autonomous zone in, uh, I don't even know what they're calling it now. I, I don't, I it, it was Chad, what whatever that yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and, and, and you know, and, and if, if that occurred in a, in a country where you had a malignant narcissist, uh, you know, it, it, it certain, the situation would look very, very different than it does right now. But it, but it is, it is interesting though, that the circumstances that would need to occur for a malignant narcissist to, to feel like someone is, is, is challenging, uh, his, uh, is, is challenging their, their, uh, their grand, their sense of grandiosity, because that's that's what happens with with malignant narcissism and with, with narcissism in general. You know, as some, someone with with a, a, a level of narcissism is perfectly capable of becoming violent, especially when if they feel like someone is challenging their grandiose sense of self. You know, someone who feels like they have you know these fantasies of un, unlimited success and brilliance. You know, if they feel like someone is challenging that. It's, it's, it's not uncommon for a narcissist to suddenly have this idea of, Oh, I have to, I'm, I have to seek revenge. You know, I, I, have, I can't, I can't allow that. But then when you have a malignant narcissist, you know, that's someone with the capacity to, to take it beyond uh, a, a, a revenge fantasy and actually become very, very violent. So, you, you know, and, and again, Rams and Katerov in Chechnya is a, is, is a prime example of a, of a malignant narcissist. But, but certainly, you know, there, there, there are situations that can absolutely be fueled or be manipulated so that if you have an idea of how this particular malignant narcissist, if you think someone is a malignant narcissist and you have an idea of how you think they're going to respond, then you can try to manipulate circumstances on the ground so that ultimately you can get that response and then that can lead to whatever, whatever your, your end goal is. Right. Yeah. So, now, now let so, me ask you. Let me ask you this. Out of all, by the way, if you hear this, that's because I'm eating uh, peanut M and M's. Uh, that's my go-to <laughs> when I'm in a good interview. So when when, when that comes from Ranger School. Uh, so when when we look at what you just described, it's clear that the president does not fit into that category. I know that you know by the law that governs, you know, your career field, you're not going to make diagnoses of people. But I think it's clear when you point out somebody like uh, the leader of Chechnya and that type of a personality, Hitler would fall into that, that personality. Um, many other world leaders would fall in that category. The president's behavior has not fallen into that category. He has not taken advantage of this for uh, absolute power. So who is, uh, who is not only uh, uh, capable of that in, in our country, but also, and in our government, but also who are these players that are, we keep saying that, that they're going to put this up so that it's a, it's the perfect environment for the president to react. If he had that personality trait, who are they? Who are the people that are putting this up and are some of them actually the ones who are this absolute power type of person? Or can you, or do you, can you even name that? Yeah. You know, I, I, the last thing that I want to do is, is, you know, I, there are, there are a lot of great individuals out there serving within, serving within the intelligence community. And I'm not in any way trying to disparage those individuals who are, serving under the oath that they swore in the intelligence community. But I, 
but I, I will say that, you know, for me on a, on a, on a personal level, when I saw, uh, when I saw up close, uh, the number of individuals who were still, uh, strongly affiliated with the IC and I saw that they were clearly taking a political side in some cases, uh, working for, um, uh, working for political organizations or contributing to political campaigns. And I saw what to me felt like blatant violations of uh, the Goldwater rule. That's what you referenced earlier, Jonathan, which is uh, it's, it's an ethical rule, which states that uh, uh, it, 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 it's, it, it's designed for psychiatrists, but really it's applicable to mental health professionals that, you know, we don't, we don't give a professional opinion about, public figures that we haven't examined in, in person. You know, we don't, we don't make a diagnosis, you know, we can talk about personality features, but we don't make a diagnosis. And I, to me, I, I saw this, this kind of strange, strange situation unfolding where individuals still affiliated with the intelligence community doing consulting work and, and involved in some cases with political campaigns. And, you know, in some cases violating to me, what looked like violating the, the Goldwater rule. I mean, that, that, that didn't fit well with me and it, it still doesn't to this day. And I, you know, I, I had to, on a personal level, you know, I had to, I had to distance myself from that because that's, uh, that's, that's not how I want to operate. You know, I'm not interested in, in uh, reverse engineering the, the political psychology process. I'm not interested in, in, in reverse engineering the, uh, the, 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 the process of, of, looking at personality traits and then create, you know, creating a situation so that a person, a person responds to that. And, and then, you know, just, you know, it, it, it to me, it, it, uh, it, it, it didn't sit well on a personal level because it felt very much like it was, um, you know, like it was just undermining, undermining our democracy. And, and, you know, and I saw, I saw the same thing happening with, with the Marxists as well, you know, that, that this, this, and I shouldn't, I shouldn't dismiss it as it was only the Mar- Marxists, but, you know, there was uh, uh, this idea of, of there was a lot of disinformation that was out there that was contributing to people feeling like they were, it was contributing to people questioning the legitimacy of our democratic process. You know, and there were, there were a lot of, a lot of, of breadcrumbs that, you know, just happened to be left out in the open that were, that, that implied that, you know, um, uh, the Russians were involved with this or the Russians were involved with that, you know, and, and, and I think I mentioned this, uh, on the show yesterday, but you know, I, I, that, that's not how the Russian intelligence apparatus operates. If, if there is, if, if, if there are, if, if there's a trip, the quote that I always like to use is if there's, if, if the Russians have left a trail of breadcrumbs, it's only because there's a bear trap waiting at the end of it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if there's, and that's, that's, that's how disinformation functions, right? And it, it, so if there, if, if you're coming across this, the, these, these breadcrumbs and it makes it easy for you to say, well, or, you know, the Russians are doing this or the Russians are doing that. Well, I, I would say in, in, in many cases, people are being manipulated into believing uh, that the Russians are doing one thing while simultaneously they're, they're, they're doing something else covertly. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I just on a personal level, I was seeing all of this, I was seeing all of this up close and it, it didn't sit well with me then. And it doesn't sit well with me now. But again, I'm not asking you to diagnose the people. I mean, I have my opinions on this stuff, but if I had to look at, at the, at the way that this stuff is unfolding, let's say, because we talked about this yesterday, you know, it may not just be the Russians. This may be a global affair with many different entities that are involved. And, and the Russians may be playing a particular role in this downfall. Or it could be the Russians, period. But what we do know is that even the tactics that the Russians use are also and have been shared by Marxists and communists and leftists through, since throughout modern history. And so... There has to be, and I guess, and I'm not asking you to name names, but when we mm-hmm. look at um, when we look at these tactical behaviors and historical 
uh, techniques and procedures that have been used by Russia and the leftists. They have to funnel in here somehow, right? Did they just put massive amounts of people in the country and push for this and create this big picture? Did they infiltrate into media and politics in order to um, influence other people that would do it for them? Uh, had, did they sit back and wait and uh, for for these big events to happen so that they can exploit those? Is it part of all those things? But how did it funnel? How has it been funneled to the front, the forefront of what's happening now? That may be a bigger question than you can answer. But I mean, even if you speculate, um, I think you're just looking at things based on what you know about radicalization, what you know about mm -hmm. uh, about um, ma ma malignant narcissists and the leaders uh, that fit that role. How do you think this has come to the point that it's at in this country? That's it's it's a great question. But because I'll, know, let me I mean, let me say this before you answer it. Because you you sure. you mentioned breadcrumbs more than once, and I think it's fascinating because you're absolutely right. You know, again, moving the goalposts. But the thing is, when you look at football and they move the goalposts, you can go back and rewind and look at how what they you know what was what was their uh, you know what was their play here, what was the maneuver there, and the same thing with breadcrumbs. You can go back historically and follow the trail backwards and see who was behind that stuff. So again, who, you know, where is this coming from? How did it funnel in here? And can we look back and, and kind of deduce this and figure it out? Yeah. You know, and, and I, and I don't know, um, you know, and, and maybe, maybe this is even giving people too much, uh, benefit of the doubt, but I, I don't, I don't know, you know, it, it, you know part of it may be that there are definitely, that there are individuals out there who, who, are within government, within the IC, who are aware, um, who are aware of, of, of I mean, I, I, I think the intelligence community is certainly aware of, of the Russian disinformation tactics, but, but I think, you know, it, it's possible that there are some individuals out there who, who just sort of accept that disinformation is, 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 is always going to be an issue in our country. And because they just accept it, they may find a way to try to exploit that for their own for their own gain. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I think, I think, I, I, I think there are certainly, it's certainly possible that there are, are individuals out there that, um, you know, there, there's a, they're, they're just sort of complicit in the Russian disinformation or just in any foreign adversary disinformation tactic. And then they try to figure out, well, how can I, how can I capitalize on that? Because it's always going to be there, but um, you know, what, what can I do with that? How can I use that? How can I use that to my advantage? But again, you know, that's, that I mean that that would be the best case scenario, right? But if you think about you know what I what I talked about yesterday with some of the Marxist organizations who, you know, there's a, there's a history of you know the organizations I talked about yesterday have there are, are very clear ties to historical ties to Russian intelligence, the Soviet intelligence, and they, they're still operating alive and well in the U S and they're still participating in violent protests. And so, you know, that's, I, I, why is that? That's, that's the question that I, and I don't have an answer to that, but just the fact that, you know, that's, that's no secret or at least it shouldn't be. Uh, and, and, and yet they're still playing the role that they're playing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer to it is, but it, it's, it, it certainly seems like, there's a level of, of, you know, there's, there are some individuals being complicit in, in foreign and in, 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 in the involvement of foreign intelligence, uh, with disinformation campaigns. So, uh, let's see here. It's a hard, that's a hard question to answer anyway, when, but it's one, I think the reason I wanted to pose it is not because I thought you would have the absolute answer for that, but it's mm -hmm. one that, I think we can follow the breadcrumbs back. And I think even if we're somewhat sure, or we kind of have an idea of who's, who's responsible for this, we can, it's good for people to hear that question. So they ask it themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so let me see here. Where, where are we going to go with this now? Um, idealizing and, de and devaluing. I'm looking over your notes and I'm, and I'm thinking about how this fits in here. Uh, you know, 
I really want to concentrate on the players that are in this. Uh, and although mm-hmm. they, they can remain nameless because we may not know them, we do know, I mean, it's clearly evident that there is a force working in this nation and in other nations at the same time using the same tactics, techniques, and procedures, using the same incidents and the same types of people um, to elicit a response, sometimes create the problem, but definitely elicit a response from people. Um, so we know that that's there. What is, um, when we talk about idolizing and devaluing, uh, mm-hmm. explain to us what, uh, what that is and is that like the hero worshipers that you mentioned yesterday where they are, they turned on, turned off or, and are these people that we described yesterday, the four categories of people, uh, which were glory seekers, hero worshipers, radical altruists, and lonely romantics. Um, are those people easily turned on and turned off? Like, will they join a cause and then they're like, ah, this isn't good or I don't trust that person or do they, or is it like Jim Jones and Jonestown where they follow them to the end and drink the Kool-Aid and die? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I I think when it comes to narcissism, what we need to keep in mind is that someone with, with narcissistic features, someone with, with that we might consider a narcissist. This is someone who, who actually feels empty. They feel inferior in some way or, or deficient in some way, you know, and, you know, that could even be, uh, that could even be a, 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 an emptiness that, you know, traces all the way back to uh, an experience that, uh, you know, the narcissist had in, in childhood where they felt like caretakers were, were absent or, or inadequate. Uh, but, you know, regardless of the cause for this, this internal state, this, this uh, uh, internal uh, emptiness, you know, the narcissist will do, everything in their power to compensate for this inner vulnerability. So one particular method of compensating of, uh, of, of maintaining that grandiose self in order to protect from the internal feeling of emptiness is the tendency to often to idealize or, or to devalue others. So, so let me explain idealizing and, and, and devaluing. Well, so again, the narcissist needs someone that they think is brilliant and great and that they can identify with. It's through that identification that the narcissist can feel, they can also feel great. They can also feel brilliant. So, so that's, that's the idealizing, right? That's, that's the idealized figure is the person that is equally as great or greater than themselves. With the devaluing, this is where, um, you know, yesterday we were talking about the need for, uh, the need for an oppressor, for an oppressive force, right? You know, I, I, I think this is where we see a lot of these individuals engaging in violence on behalf of Marxism. Uh, you know, the, the narcissist needs someone to devalue because it's, it's really it's a way of compensating for that, for that inner vulnerability. If you, and, and so it's, it's in the same way that they need the idealized figure, they also need to devalue others. So if they can only relate, associate with those who are equally as great or greater, then that means the vast majority of people that the narcissist comes into contact with is someone who is not equally as great or greater. And they're often going to engage in this pattern of, of, of devaluing and that devaluing can, can take, can take many forms, you know, and that's, you know, that could be sort of a, you know, a, a typical, you know, person with, with narcissistic features, not uncommon at all. You know, we're probably all guilty of having some elements of narcissism every now and then, but for someone who, those, you know, for someone with with narcissism that's a, that's a bit more uh, present and a bit more in, in, intense, you know, this is somebody who, if they're going to devalue you, they're gonna they're gonna they might exploit you, or they're going to kind of always be putting you down, you know, making mean comments and things like that. But if you, but it, it's not always that that um, that innocent, you know, it can get it can get a lot more violent. Mm-hmm. So if you if you push back, if you challenge the narcissist's uh, uh, grandiose sense of self, you know it can lead to rage. It can lead to a desire for revenge. But in some cases, you know, particularly again with like malignant narcissists, it can it can lead to violence. But 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 this devaluing. I mean this this is an inevitable step that occurs 
in the relationship between the narcissist and that person that the narcissist has chosen as an idealizable figure, uh, the person that they worship as someone they want to emulate. So it's not just, it's not just that they're going to devalue the people that they haven't chosen as the idealized figure. It's also that if you happen to find yourself uh, being that idealized figure, that, that, that heroic person for a narcissist, well, don't get too comfortable because ultimately what ends up inevitably happening is that you yourself uh, will become devalued as well. You know, and that's, so, you know, one thing that you, you just said there, um, I read a long time ago about uh, narcissists. That, that is the, and it's really making a lot of sense now, that is the nail in the coffin, is that when they steal your energy and when they, when they draw you close, eventually you're going to become their secondary energy and you're just going to be uh, left and they're only going to use you when they need you if they're not getting the primary energy. So if we have these leaders... Um, whether it be Russian or whatever that's happening and affecting the, the United States, when they get what they want, it, I think it's, it's easy to see that it becomes a process of feeding their ego. And that's why communism never works is because the people that take everybody there, they did first destroy the country to get there. They convince the people to destroy their own country. And then once they get there, it really becomes all about them, all about that leader, all about their attention and how great and powerful they can be. Is that right? At, at, absolutely. I mean, you, you know, you, you really got me thinking about this, uh, about this yesterday because, you know, this, this process of, of destroying the thing that you had previously been holding up in such high regard, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a, it's a phenomenon that, um, it's really interesting because it's a phenomenon that has existed really within the evolution of communism and Marxism since, since its uh, inception. You know, there's, there's a term that comes to mind to explain this process in the history of communism, which it's uh, political necrophagy. Now it's a, it's a, it's a funny term, but political necrophagy. So necrophagy just means the practice of feeding on a corpse. Okay. Mm -hmm. But in the history of the Soviet union, Anytime a new leader took over from the old, they would engage in a sort of political necrophagy, which was a way for a, a new leader to, to capture the optics of the moment and demonstrate that any former injustices and crimes and failed policies committed by the previous administration, well, that all fell entirely on their predecessors. So it, it, it was a way to, to, to suddenly distance yourself from previous policies even though the leaders who were taking over, you know, likely played a vital role in those policies, as well as a way of dispensing with anyone who could potentially become a, a political challenger or, or rival. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is, you, you see this in politics all over the world, right? You certainly see this all the time in American politics as well, except, you know, in the case of the Soviet Union, this political necrophagy usually meant people were killed. You know, mm -hmm. it happened when, when Stalin took over from Lenin yesterday, I was, I was thinking about this yesterday. You, you, uh, you mentioned, uh, Trotsky, Trotsky, who, who played a vital role in the Bolshevik revolution. Well, you know, when Stalin took over, he actually had Trotsky assassinated along with many others. And then again, when Nikita Khrushchev took over after Stalin's death, what did he do? Well, he executed all of Stalin's top officers. So, so the reason this is so important, the reason I bring this up is Marxism, communism, socialism, these ideological movements, well, they always end up eating their own, just like the narcissist will inevitably seek to destroy uh, that, that very thing that the narcissist had been holding up in such high regard. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and ultimately, I mean, that, that should be a warning for those who are considered, who are considering subscribing to, to Marxism, you know, you you might feel like it provides a sense of belonging right now, but eventually you might be the one who ends up getting labeled an oppressor. Mm -hmm. You might be the one who ends up facing the wrath of an ideology that has no problem dispensing of you once you've served its purpose. That's usually what happens. I mean, that's why everybody that, whenever you watch these, 
historical uh, documentaries, which on Netflix, it's very, <laughs> it's actually quite funny the way that they insert stuff about President Trump when they're talking about the Nazis. I find that very interesting. But they, um, the one thing that definitely comes out of it is that you see how scared the people are that work around these types of people because they can be consumed in a minute and not even Absolutely. given a second thought. Absolutely. And you see this everywhere. I mean, it's all over modern politics. And, and, and w did you see it? Cause I didn't see it before in politics. I mean, is this a modern creation? Did I'm asking you a lot of questions at the same time. Did, <laughs> did the advent of television, for instance, you know, they, if you watch the first debate uh, between uh, that was televised, which was between um, Kennedy and Nixon, it, the people that listened to on the radio said Nixon won. The people that watched it on television said that Kennedy won it, right? So is it have these individuals become more prevalent because of the advent of media and how quickly they can garner so much power? I mean, mm -hmm. it, because it seems like to me, you know, I had a friend, I'm not, I won't just tell anybody who he is, but, uh, I had a friend that, uh, we could go into a bar and that guy could identify the women in a bar who were broken, you know, who had had something happen before that didn't get along with their dad. And before long, he'd be sitting there having a conversation with him and everybody else is like, does this girl not see who this guy is? <laughs> And, but, but yet they wouldn't because he knew, he just instinctually knew. And actually, this is where I learned a lot about narcissists. This guy instinctually knew who to, uh, who to pinpoint and who to go after. And I, I can't help but think that narcissists in general know that. And when something like media comes up or when the psyche of a nation starts to falter a little bit, like they start to get too comfortable. Um, and then they start to be guilty like this, uh, what's going on now that all this, uh, white guilt or, uh, corporate guilt or any, whatever you want to call it. Uh, everybody seems to be guilty for doing something that nobody has really done. They're just apologizing for everything. Do, do these narcissists see this and are almost called to this position to jump in and start taking over? Well, you know, I, I, I would say keep in mind with yesterday we were talking about, um, uh, you know, Marxism on, on, on college campuses, that, that uh, phenomenon of, of critical thinking going down and susceptibility to an ideology like Marxism uh, going up. And, I, you know, I mentioned that the result of that, of that phenomenon is, is, is that you see people who, as they gravitate towards something like Marxism, They'll, they'll often kind of a, a, a adopt this sort of postmodernist mindset where, again, everything is about my truth and whatever the, the reality, whatever the facts on the ground might be, are irrelevant because it's all about I'm, I'm, I'm defining my reality by, by the way that I feel. So, you know, someone who is sort of in that mindset of, uh, feeling a bit sort of ungrounded because everything is sort of fluid, right? Reality itself has become sort of fluid based off of, you know, it's all about what's occurring in the present moment. Well, you know, this is somebody who, who is, is, is certainly susceptible to, to something like, to something like Marxism. And again, it's not, you know, it's, it's not just about the leaders. It's also about the followers who, as I said yesterday, are, are perfectly capable of being, of being Marxist themselves. And so there's, there's, I mean, it's, it's somebody who has that, that who's, who's subscribed to that Marxist ideology, who has started to kind of fall into this postmodernist mindset. Uh, and, and, you know, combine that with, with narcissistic features, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's sort of the, you know, it, suddenly they, they become the, the sort of perfect target for, uh, getting reeled into carrying out, um, in some cases, potential acts of violence, um, and without even being fully aware of, of, of who might be pulling the strings. Mm -hmm. And and so you, you can see how those how those 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 features all kind of work together, right? You know the 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 the, the, the Marxist ideology, the the postmodernism, 
the the vulnerability and again we all have you know our, our personality characteristics uh you know certainly kind of define us and 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 you know represent how we see the world but but they're also they can be potential vulnerabilities and in this case you know you combine all those factors postmodernism marxism and and these underlying vulnerabilities and it it becomes really easy to to manipulate someone so w- with all this talk about about the narcissist and mal- the malignant narcissist and the way that they thrive in this environment and the people uh, that we've talked about yesterday and today that are tricked into because of their psyche. I'm not saying everybody's tricked into it. People make their own decisions, but they end up, Mm -hmm. you know, following like a Marxist or something like Charles Manson. They follow them and do their bidding, which is happening now just on a grand scale. Um, But the other part of this is that the rest of the country doesn't, there's inaction. And we've seen this through history where people are, People are oppressed. They rise up. They fight for their freedom. They get their freedom. Then over a period of time, they become comfortable. And as they become more and more comfortable, they give up their freedom to people who say, we'll take care of you. You just be comfortable. And then eventually they become oppressed. Then they become potentially enslaved, but definitely oppressed. And then every throughout their the future of their history, you have people who rise up and want to claim their freedom again. This seems to be a cycle throughout history. What is it that uh, about these, you know, once these narcissists get a hold on a, on a community and Mm -hmm. you're going to have your followers. I talked about Drago in Poland, how you have, uh, you know, you have your um, strong men who go out and and do uh, the will of uh, the dictator or the socialist leader or whatever, the Marxist leader. Mm-hmm. And then, mm-hmm. b- but still, and I've talked about that stuff tremendously, but on the other side of the coin are the masses that know something's going wrong. They see what's happening. They don't like it. They realize they're starting to be oppressed and they've given up too much freedoms, but they don't act. They just, they sit on their couch and they're angry and they feel like they're doing something because they're on social media. Is that in of itself a form of the same type of narcissism where they, where we are caught up in our own lives, our own self, and, the, and we just don't act? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, you know, the, the, the first, I, I definitely think, one of the reasons why, you know, people might be sort of prone to dismissing concerns about, about Marxism, um, is because, well, well, two things. Number one, I mean, I think I said this yesterday that one of the reasons why, uh, uh, at least with Russian disinformation, one of the reasons why it's so effective is that to call it out, to name it, um, it, it, it immediately, it becomes very easy for you to immediately become dismissed as just a, a, another conspiracy theorist. And so it's sort of, it's designed in a way that it makes it very difficult to, uh, to call it out. Not only was you know? I, not only was I dismissed when I, cause I was one of the first and only people, um, after I started hosting on radio, I was one of the only people that, that talked about communism and talked about the red green Alliance, which is the Islamic and the mm-hmm. Russian Alliance or the communist reliance or, or Alliance. And um, I, I remember in 2000 and I don't know, it was like 15, five years ago, five or six years ago on Sean Hannity's TV show, not just the radio show, but on the television show, I talked about on the radio too, about what well, didn't affect us here, but they don't realize that we are a collection. Dr. Stanley Milgram in 1969, mm-hmm. how he did a study mm-hmm. on, you know, you had the, and I've talked about this on here, on here before, where you had, uh, he called in. Um, I put an ad out in the school paper. He had people come in and he said, okay, I'm going to sit you at this, in, in this station and you are going to uh, flip a switch every time that person in there gets a question wrong. And it, and, and then you'll increase the shock. It's going to shock them. And then every question after that, you increase it. Every time they get a question wrong, you, you increase the shock. And then it would say like zero on one side and X, X, X on the other where it meant death. And these people took people all the way to death. And 
so I guess with, with that, having spoke out and shown that proof, mm-hmm. I, it, it's not like people were saying this freaking guy gets it. You know, it wasn't like that. It was, let's go to the next subject. Yeah. Cause they, they just looked at me as though I was, uh, yeah, I don't crazy or tin full hat. And now here we are five years later and it, it's already come to fruition where not only are these mad men out there, or mad women or whoever that's leading this stuff, you have people that are willing to destroy and burn and ruin people's lives and get them fired. Absolutely. Yep. And, yep. and and for something that they know nothing about, they only know the depth of what they're told, just like that person sitting at the chair, not really, not knowing that the person in the other room is an actor. They sit right in that chair and believe they are taking that person to death, but they're doing it in the name of science. And these people have no depth in their, in their convictions. They have no idea the reality of what's behind all this. Absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, I, I going back to the idea of this, this, this dichotomy that, you know, we're out, that we're now sort of all forced to, to abide by. I mean, I, look, I, I know I've, I've been focusing primarily on, on the Marxist organization, but, you know, disinformation, uh, as I said yesterday, I mean, it, it, it definitely seeks to exploit all ends of, of, of the spectrum and all, and all beliefs, you know, everyone is vulnerable. So, so yeah, you certainly have, you also have, you know, you have white supremacy organizations, you have anarchist groups that are contributing to the violence, contributing to the chaos. I mean, in my personal opinion, I think that the, 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 you know, the biggest players involved in perpetuating the chaos, I believe it's, 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 it's Marxism, but you certainly have disinformation being used to manipulate, uh, you know, virtually, virtually everyone, you know, regardless of whether you maintain some sort of extremist belief or, um, you know, maybe you're not an extremist, but, you know, again, it, it, if, if, it's, if it's designed, if the messaging is designed in a way to appeal to your, those, those particular traits that you possess, then, then it could, it could potentially be effective. But, but, you know, we, we, when we have this situation where we, we all have to abide by this dichotomy, and again, that kind of goes back to the, to the Overton window conversation. And, you know, if, if, either you're for this position or you must be for whatever the polar opposite of that position is. And then that, that mindset that becomes, uh, that, that becomes a sort of heuristic in and of itself because it's a way for people to simplify how they view what's happening in the world and to easily dismiss potentially alternative points of view. And so over time dialogue happens less and less. And then you've got people who become more and more, uh, complacent, you know, and they, they dismiss things as either being conspiracies or they assume someone else is, is, is going to, is going to, uh, to try to address the issue. So, you know, I, I think if we're talking about, you know, what, what can we do in this entire scenario? What can we do to avoid falling into this trap of, of, of being manipulated by extremist ideologies? You know, I mean, uh, to begin with, you know, stay informed. Whatever, whatever news sources, whatever news sources you normally use, just try to expose yourself to alternative points of view. I, you know, that's, that's an idea that, that shouldn't sound all that radical, but unfortunately I think it is. But, and, and, you know, don't, don't get your news off social media. And, and again, as I said before, you know, recognize that the, the, the characteristics that, that are, are unique to all of us as individuals, you know, they can also, those are also characteristics that, that can be exploited by adversaries, you know, and, and, and something else to keep in mind is if you're ever wondering if you've become a useful idiot in all of this, just play it out in your head. Examine whether your present actions might be leading us closer to the America that our foreign adversaries would like to see. So play that out and ask yourself, where do I fall in all this? Mm-hmm. Well, that I think that is the question that... I think we should end on that question. And here's here's what I want you to do. You know, I just got a an email from a mentor of mine that was talking about how they grew up in the projects in New York. They were born in the 50s and grew up in the 60s, and they were there for the race riots and, and the different things that were happening then. My question is for you. If you look back, and, and we don't talk about this today, but if you want to look into this, um, is 
how much is similar to what happened then and and how much is different in other words how what what are the what's the difference between the forces that are in the background now versus then was it then was it were these these leftist forces behind the riots and behind the 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 movements in the 60s the race riots or or uh or was it different because we definitely see it now we know that we know that the the tension that's happened in this country is being throttled up by groups other than those that are concerned about race and safety we know that because nobody's doing anything to stop it so and we've talked about this at nauseum but if you want to look in that i'd love to have you back on and talk more about this and then Absolutely. and then i'm going to monitor my social media and see what questions people have uh, i'm going to go back and listen to these shows again and then let's pick back up on this uh next week if you want and uh we'll discuss a little bit more of this stuff Absolutely, man. I'd, I'd be honored to, to be back on and, and uh, really enjoy these conversations that we're having. So I'd, I'd be happy to do that. They're important. It's important. And I'll tell you what's great about this show is that, you know, I do a lot of <clears throat> majority of the shows, me comment, my own commentary. But in cases like this, it's incredible to have somebody like yourself who, who doesn't just have the the knowledge you didn't just go to school and get a, a, a you know a doctor of clinical mm -hmm. psychology right you you have experience in military intelligence you have experience in understanding radicalization and disinformation and and now in real world time you're able to look at this and help people understand it and you know so as you go back and you listen to these shows things that you think that you've missed that you feel is important all, of course all you gotta do is let me know and and we'll have you back on and we'll talk about it some more. That sounds great. All right. So yeah. doc, go ahead. I, I was going to say, absolutely, man. I, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a definitely a worthy conversation to, to continue with. Um, you know, I, I, you know, one of the reasons why I, I, I uh, you know, wanted to talk to you about all of this is just, I, I got to a point where I was just, you know, it, it, I, I, I was so frustrated with just how wrong, uh, disinformation was, was being portrayed. I was so frustrated with the fact that there, there is no dialogue out there. At least there, it didn't seem like there, that there hasn't been really much of a dialogue out there about the role of, of Marxism, uh, in all of this. And, and, and so I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's an important conversation to, uh, to continue. Good. And we will continue it. Uh, Dr. Cody McGinnis, military intelligence veteran, doctor of clinical psychology, an expert on disinformation, radicalization. If you want to find him, he's the president of Geosite Consulting LLC or Consultants LLC, and you can find him at geopsychconsultants.com. Man, I really do appreciate it. Is, are you on social media? Is there anything that you want to plug on social media? I avoid social media. Smart, <laughs> smart. It's yeah, probably going to, it, it'll probably be the downfall <laughs> of my career, but well, I'll keep uh, banging it around for now. Cause that's the main way that I can, uh, I can sure. converse with people. So, but listen, I thank you, brother. Thank you for all that you've done for this nation. Thank you for your concern for the nation. And, um, and again, uh, this is the conversation that needs to happen. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jonathan. You got it, brother. And so that folks will, will close out the show on that. And, you know, in, as I talked before, in 1969, Dr. Stanley Milgram did a study. I want you to go look up that study. And I want you to understand that there were people that he proved that there were people that would go along with an experiment that would kill somebody. And they would take part in that experiment because they thought they were doing it for the greater good of science or for their grades. They were the useful idiots. Now, what's happening in this day and age is that you are the useful idiot. Whether you're somebody that's out there participating and going forward and actually doing the madman's work or you're sitting there doing nothing, you are useless. It's time to start being useful. This is The Experts. I'm Jonathan Gillum. The truth has arrived. Peace and we're out of here.